curious and was curious. Why is it cold? Why is it warm? Why does it snow? Why does it rain? Why does the sun seem to go down? It actually doesn't go down, but it seems to go down. Every child is curious about the, um, the natural world. And through schooling, we kill it. We totally kill it. Now, there are reasons why this goes on. Part of it has to do with the, the poverty of our ability to teach mathematics well in the elementary school, which is the language of science. Because mathematics is beautiful and a lot easier to handle than language. A lot easier to handle. So the fact is, we're naturally curious. We have a lot of time on our hands. And our utilitarian purpose, narrowly defined as just surviving, can be done, a lot of it, without us. So the question is, how do we survive? So if you want to answer the question through work, there's no question that the future of work is at the margins of invention. And the margins of invention depend on knowledge. The days of Thomas Edison tinkering in his basement and coming up with a long, with a, with a recording device or an electric light bulb are over. Ignorant tinkering has no future. So I have to learn about computers. So I have to learn about science and technology. <coughs> Not possible. The motivations for innovation are always the same. Good ideas. And the reason that um, education is necessary is because actually the things that will compete in a worldwide economy are the things that catch fire quickly. So. An education a curriculum, what you study, has to be driven by a need to know. And the need to know is based in you and is based on the answering of very fundamental questions. What am I going to do with my life? And how am I going to spend my time? And how do I develop a sense of well-being that prevents me from being envious of the next person? That is to say, willing to come to terms with my own lot in life. That has to do with the way I see my own purpose and my own sense of satisfaction. So all learning is ultimately useful. Now there's a much larger question. If in fact few of us are needed, most of us are superfluous. If half the world's population disappeared, there would be huge consequences. I'm not talking about the moral consequences. But I'm not sure the progress of civilization would be at risk in terms of a practical utility. Especially in an affluent country like the United States. Now, what's interesting is that what we need more of is service. Things that the marketplace doesn't pay for. Who's going to pay for taking care of old people? You don't have enough nurses. You don't have people who are in nursing kinds of profession. Who's going to actually take care of the environment? Who's going to take care of things that don't make money? The real growth in the economy is in service, but the problem there is how to pay for it. That's why I have all the debates in Congress. Who's going to, how are we going to support the older people who don't work? So those are political questions. But even in the service, in the area of service, whether it's teaching or medicine or nursing or any kind of working with people, in order to work with people, especially in a, in a worldwide context, you're going to have to know something. You're going to have to understand the other person. And the other person increasingly is going to look different from ourselves. 
Connecticut, one of the original founding colonies, dominated by Puritan, fanatical, unpleasant Christians who hated other Christians, who considered them the founders of America. They're a minority. And you're going to have to meet people who come, largely from Mexico, from Latin America, from Asia, from Africa. And you have to talk to them. You have to know something about them. Now you can teach yourself on it. The internet, the problem with the internet, the internet is a great thing, and technology is a great thing. But the fact is, it's a sewer without a filter. How can you distinguish lies from truth? And most of what's on the internet is negatively spun and undifferentiated, which means the purpose of institutions is to use technology, not fight it, in order to help you have the ability on your own to filter out that which is plausible from that which is implausible. My view is that curriculum shouldn't be based on fields, but based on questions. So if you want to know why things operate or how things will operate, you'll need a mixture of physics, chemistry, and biology, and computer science. The disciplines that academics have organized are way out of date. The structure of the university is a 19th, early 20th century structure which has never been changed to meet the current conditions of research. So the division between psychology, anthropology, sociology, this is really not relevant to your need to know. What is relevant to your need to know are the issues you pose, the questions you raise. And we in the university are, need to be responsive to being able to answer those questions. Now, there's some fundamental skills that you need. The skills in the manipulation of language. To learn how to write, not to read, to write. Passive understanding of something is not understanding. The only way to read is to learn what it means to write. It's the only way you're going to actually be able to ask the right question. So it is development of linguistic skills, which is at the core of this entire enterprise. And to be able to express them, particularly in writing. Although oral self-presentation, I believe in the teaching of public speaking, and someday you'll actually be able to argue something over a visual network. In our own country, you, those, of, those of you who are in the community college uh, system as students and as faculty will recognize this. <clears throat> You're at the front lines of the most difficult part of the American education system because most of you are here in community college, we're shortchanged in high school. The weakest link in the American educational system is not the community college, it's not the elementary school. It is actually when education meets adolescence. This is a battle which puberty wins in the tribe of ignorance over any kind of real human development. The brain shuts down as the pelvis lights up. <laughs> now there's a way actually to connect the brain and the pelvis, which is part of our job as educators. There is no way to learn unless you like learning. So emotional attachment, the thrill you get in dating and communicating with friends and conspiring and maneuvering and dissembling and betraying and all the things that create time and the illusion of progress. That's why people get divorced so often. They're like people on, an, on a stage set and they just change the scenery. The problem is nothing changes in their lives, just the scenery behind them. People change jobs all the time, same thing. The real source of a sense of satisfaction is interior. So, can we find a way with the adolescent 
to make learning enjoyable, fun. Sports has done so in the United States because it's physical, it's kind of physical reality. We're successful with music, we're successful with theater, because they also build communities of young people doing the same thing. They're on a team, they're on stage, they feel like they're doing something, somebody's watching them. We need to find ways, in other words, to improve how we deal with mathematics, science, language, history, all those things in a way that's classroom based but creates a community of learners, people who enjoy being together collaboratively, not competitively. That's why standardized testing is, it, is not a good way of measuring or motivating. Testing is important, absolutely important, but testing for learning. The kind of tests we give don't teach you anything. You took the test, you don't even know what you got wrong. I have no idea what was right or wrong. You said Nigeria was at the North Pole, and for all you know, it was the right answer. All you got was an aggregate, ag aggregate result. We have technology that actually could respond to the question. So if someone asked you, you know, who was president of the United States when Pearl Harbor was bombed? Okay? And they gave you, first of all, a whole multiple choice question. Is it, is it dishonest? manipulation from the 1940s of what learning is. Nobody has a job based on a multiple choice question. So you don't go even to McDonald's. And the, you look at the list, the person doesn't say to you, what would you like, A, B, C, D, or F, or none of the above. <laughs> right? You come in wanting something. You're rolled into a, into a hospital. Before the doctor looks at you, looks and examines you, and then some other doctor gives her a multiple choice test of what's wrong with the patient. Doesn't happen that way. They say, what's wrong with the patient? The doctor has to make a differential diagnosis on her own. So multiple choice is nonsense. But imagine the multiple choice question, which is, so the presence of Franklin Delano Roosevelt, Harry Truman, Woodrow Wilson, George Washington. Okay, so, and, and because test takers are morons, test writers are morons, are second rate people. I know I've never had dinner with anyone who's written a test, a standardized test, not a test for their own classroom. I wouldn't dine with such a person, unless they were desperate for the money. But they're usually mediocre people don't understand the subject. You write the Regents test in New York, I wouldn't, not people I respect in their field. No great mathematician has ever written the new Regents test in mathematics, said New York. The fifth question they put, because these, these people are angry people who write tests, they write tests actually to fool you. They're not interested in, in supporting the little that you know. They want to cheat you out of the little you know. So they say Franklin Roosevelt, Harry Truman, Woodrow Wilson, George Washington, and Franklin Delano so, and Del Rosa Jr. There was such a person. He just didn't have me president of the United States. Okay? Now here I am, I'm, I'm, I'm taking the standardized test, it's clocked, and I think, oh, it's Franklin Del Rosa, Franklin Del Rosa Jr. Aha. I thought it was just Franklin Del Rosa. It was really Franklin Del Rosa Jr. And you know, I'm gonna outsmart the test taker because the test taker tried to outsmart me, and you end up giving the wrong answer. Instead of actually actually supporting the idea of what the person knew, the common sense goal would be leave it blank and give an answer. So it's choosing the answer. So the person who said Franklin Delano Roosevelt, Jr., knew a lot and got cheated out of it out of the insecurity of the environment of the test. The false right answer. Completely cruel and unnecessary. Cruel and unnecessary. The person who said Franklin Delano Roosevelt maybe got it right, doesn't even know why he or she got it right. The person who said Harry Truman knows a lot. It's not a zero-sum game. That person knows a lot. They have the right war, right? They're in the same decade. Imagine that kind of accuracy in fourth century ancient history. Somebody is considered educated to say, 
that the Peloponnesian War took place in the 5th century. That's a whole hundred years to have a right answer. It's a big dartboard. So why not give this person, you know, some help? Even the person that said Woodrow Wilson knows a lot. They have the right century. They have a world war. They have associated Pearl Harbor with a world war. It had to be the wrong world war, but it's close. <coughs> Not only that, but a lot of the combatants are the same. So there's a little fixing to do there. The person said George Washington is a, it's a harder case. <laughs> <laughs> Takes more time. That's me in the tennis court. That's a lot of time, but it's doable. Doable. So I'm saying this is a testing is not helpful to the creation of the motivation and the creation of a curriculum. Testing is very important because standards are very important. We live in a worldwide context, which means you know, we need to know, especially if you want to be a nurse or a doctor, that you know what you're doing because you could kill somebody. Somebody who gets an easy grade in a poetry class will do no harm except to the unlikely possibility that they'll have readers. You know, uh, but uh, and that can't be. That's not harmful to your life. Just a waste of your time. But you know, somebody who doesn't know a liver from a kidney you know, will, will put you down quickly for no reason. So we need to have standards. We need to know what people do uh, and how they how they actually. Um, assume information. The community college, which is a great institution in principle, uh, needs actually to um, take the place of the American high school. In my view, the American high school should be abolished in its current form, and that actually um, compulsory schooling should end at 16 at the end of the 10th grade. There should be simply elementary school and secondary school, which ends at the end of the 10th grade. Providing the bare minimum education for functioning in, in citizenship, and then throwing young people at 16 on their own. So they're treated like young adults, not like big children. And they have to develop the motivation themselves to learn. The recognition that nobody out there is going to take care of them, except they themselves. And in an environment of learning in which we can actually adjust for the differences in facility, not so much the difference in abil so-called ability. And we have to provide them with um, a curriculum that they can actually go on directly to college or return later after some time at work. Because sometimes working in an unskilled way can motivate a person to figure out what he or she wants to do. We actually run, Bard runs, a bunch of these early colleges, one in Newark, which is 100%, almost 100% African-American, one in Queens, which is very diverse racially, and Manhattan. These are public schools in which young people enter uh, at the end of the eighth grade. They do nine, 10. They finish high school at the end of the 10th grade. They do two years of college inside the high school. They come out with an AA degree. So we have three such institutions in the public sector. And we'd like to expand that network nationally. So these, it's, it's, it's cheaper, actually, uh, than, but an easier way would be to, to give access to the community college to high school students very early, um, which is, there are many ways of solving this, not one solution. But the most important message to those of you who teach is to organize the curriculum in a way that responds not to your training and to your convenience, but to an honest answer to the question is, what do my students need to know? The second thing we have to do as faculty members is to formulate that way in a way to take the most cynical. Because Americans grow up in an environment which tells a huge lie. And that lie is that fame and fortune are disconnected from education. Take Hollywood. Hollywood stardom, the dream of everybody. Now, instant success. Yeah, there are people of instant success. 
This is, what, what's this guy, Bieber? What's his name? What's this guy? He's a person without any evident talent. Please, Lady Gaga has real moxie. She has, she has real, she knows what she's doing. She's a real performance artist. You know, I think she, she's terrific. Um, but, but you know, there's everything from the older generation of Paris Hilton to this Justin Bieber and so forth. And so people dream of a kind of short circuit to fame and money. So that short circuit exists for very few. That's not a model. Being very rich and very famous is not an option for all of us. The second, of course, is the belief that the short-term emotional rewards will last you. So if you look at the divorce rates, if you look at the same couple, day two, where they're in each other's laps, and day 4,030, they're for some reason not in each other's laps anymore. <laughs> now you could change those people and to go back, that's the stage set. But the length of our life, and all the evidence we have from psychologists is that family, relationships, intimacy, isn't quite enough. For the older generation, work made the difference. People who grew up in the Depression, they didn't ask a lot of questions about the meaning of my life because they had to eat the next day. So immigrant families, very poor families of ambition, they have a tendency to manage life better. For those of us where necessity is not that close to us, it's a little bit of privilege, a little bit of comfort, there's an unreality. And the fact is education is one of the most important routes to happiness. Because it's one of the ways you discover your own uniqueness. <coughs> In the end, the utility of education is the renewal of your belief in the value of your own life. The joy you have in reading and losing a sense of time from that clock, because you recognize or you respond to a beauty that wasn't self-evident. Where you're active, not a passive watcher of a TV show or a movie, but you're actually engaged yourself, like the player of golf. He didn't play, or she didn't play as well as Tiger Woods, but loved the four hours they spent, and they thought they did well, and they improved their game. Well, the entire world of learning, of observation of the natural world, the joy you feel at learning how to do something, what older generations used to do in fix it yourself, people who you know fixed their cars and, and fixed, you know, made radio sets and built model airplanes and things like that. Well, there's a moral equivalent of that. The things that now happen, especially with using the computer, require more knowledge. Instead of using that computer as a passive object, imagine controlling it, really being able to program it. You need to learn a lot about computer science to do that. Command the machine, not have the machine command you. Not be simply the consumer, but a producer in the society of things that you value. And that's what education enables you to do. So this is entirely useful. And the things that you teach, we teach, are pretty basic. So it's not about a business degree in accounting. In order to be a really great accountant and to compete effectively, you have to pretty understand on what basis that accounting system is based. You have to understand the manipulation of mathematics. You have to understand the law and how business works. I met a guy who made a lot of money, a lot of money. His business is convincing rich people finding ways for rich people to avoid paying taxes. 
I wouldn't have thought of this as a business, but somebody's very rich and want to pay taxes. So how do I not pay taxes and not go to jail? So I said to him, are you a lawyer? He said, no. I said, but I'm a problem solver. I'm very good at mathematics. Very good at mathematics. And so I figure problems and, I, and I, I, I'm an observer. He's a very voracious reader of fiction, novels. He never took an accounting class in his life. So I asked him, well, what is the most unusual problem you ever had? And how'd you solve it? He said, well, do you really want to know? He said, a long time ago, I solved the following problem. A man wanted to leave his son a billion dollars. But in order to leave his son in his lifetime, he wanted to avoid taxes, because the estate tax at the time was 50 cents on the dollar, which means if he gave the son the billion dollars, the son would, Uncle Sam would take 500 million, and Sonny would get only 500 million. He wanted the son to get the whole billion. And he went to every lawyer, every accountant, they said there's no way to do it. And he, he said to the client, if you give me $250 million of that, I actually succeed in your passing the billion dollars on, right? Since you know you went to everybody and everybody told you there's no way to do this, we'll split the profit. You understand the proposition? You don't want to do it, I won't give you the solution. And you don't have to pay me if the solution doesn't work. So if not, you know, I operate on you and the patient dies, I still get the fee. No. Only if it works do I get paid. They had a deal. He figured it out, and he got paid. How did he figure it out? This is truly ingenious. Even if the story is not true, it's great. <laughs> How did he do it? He discovered by thinking, by close observation, that America cares more about sex and marriage than it cares about money. Which means the most powerful laws have to do with marriage. And marriage is a legal contract. So he arranged for the man with the money to divorce his wife in a mutually agreeable manner, which did not affect the said billion dollars. He then arranged for the man to marry the girlfriend of his son in an agreement that actually, if she either ran away or divorced, she would forfeit, the thing would go into a trust this money. Then, married to this girlfriend, he transferred the billion dollars to the girlfriend, now his wife, with whom he never slept. There was never any intention. Turns out the American government, unlike the Catholic Church, is not interested whether you had intercourse with your wife. <laughs> it's not about annulment. It's all about a legal contract. You can be married to somebody and nothing goes between you at all. You know, just M&Ms. Huh? <laughs> so then, he now has transferred the money to his wife, who then divorces him, marries the son, the object of this transaction, and transfers the money to him. Uncle Sam didn't get a penny of it. Now, is this person just naturally clever? No. He's very well educated. What did he learn? He learned how to think, how to problem solve, how to look at problems from different perspectives, to sociologically understand that the marriage laws, we think of marriage and we think of a relationship. He was able to reconceptualize the idea of marriage <coughs> Merely as a contract between people. 
that has privileges under the law, which of course is why the movement for gay marriage is properly so successful. How do you learn how to do that? I was taught how to do that. That's what you're in school to learn. But the only way you can learn it is if the teachers create a curriculum that teaches you the skill that is applicable to life. And that's where the need to know is based. So utility is the only basis to construct the curriculum. The question is, well, how do you define that utility shouldn't be defined by legislators, but by a, by a conversation between the students and the teachers. So the question is, you need to put on the table the kind of problems you think you want to learn how to solve. You need to put on the table, as teachers, the kind of things we think you need to learn to figure them out. And the hardest thing is how to frame the question. The most important thing you will learn in any kind of schooling is what question to ask. So, that's my plea for utility. I'm happy to answer any questions if you have any. Thank you for coming. The reason is because those of us, those people running the music program, question about the future of music education. So there are many reasons. One of it, of course, is the obvious answer that the people cutting out the, the music programs reflect a kind of general American attitude about the arts, that they're decorative and secondary. This is an ignorant view of the arts. So it, the reason is that, go back to useful, the arts are hugely useful, hugely useful in motivating a variety of skills, including scientific and mathematical skills. So visualization, conceptualization of time, all these things, uh, memory, all these things that music and art encourage are hugely cognitively useful and it's completely ignorant. But we in the music business have, have done a bad job of defending it. So the sports has been sold to America on a variety of platforms having to do with the sports. Number one, what we think is attractive and exciting, beautiful, you know. We, so the, we've turned the sports people into heroes. Second of all, we've been sold a bill of goods about sound body, sound mind. Even though the sports program is really about gladiators, not about making everybody. College sports programs are totally dishonest. You have a lot of unhealthy people watching a few over-exercised people only have to have replacement parts later in life fighting for the flag. It's gladiatorial, it's totally Roman. It's not participatory. All those sports facilities, the big campuses, don't benefit the majority of the student body. They're not any healthier because Duke won the basketball championship. The kids at Duke are less healthy because they won the, the, the championship. In other words, so it's, it's not about. But the Americans believe sports is health. Sports is good citizenship. Sports is learning to play together. Um, sports is democratic. I don't know what it is, really. Sports is, is community building, blah, blah, blah. We in music have never made those arguments. We've never actually connected ourselves to the main conduct of people's lives. So we look sort of irrelevant. The only people who hold up, who stand for music, are the Protestant churches. Because from their point of view, music is getting closer to God. So their legislators are a little less eager to cut those programs. Because they have a lobby, that considers music not superfluous, but essential to the profession of faith. What would you have in a country that is allowed that the music school now, and what he has done now to the yeah, children in L.A.? I'm about to go to conduct uh, in Venezuela, and uh, I know that the Mel, well, I'm going to do the Bolivar Orchestra in September, I'm doing the Youth Orchestra of Caracas. That's a social, it's completely funded by the government. The government that made it really popular is, I hate to say, the dictatorship. Um, so beware what you wish for. You know, um, it's a great program, but it cannot be rough day in the United States because we're a democracy. And because, um, but what we learn from El Sistema is that participating in musical ensembles is very good as a youth 
It's not about music. The power of social success system has nothing to do with music. It has to do with its usefulness as a social instrument of creating community, habits of responsibility, getting kids off the streets, reducing crime, all those things. It has a social utility. That's what's driven the success of El Sistema. That's how Brayo's genius. Now, it happens to be that a couple of musicians emerge out of it, but that's not its purpose. He believes in music making as a community, as a spiritual builder of community, the way we believe in sports. We believe the sports creates community. Every, every college, university has t-shirts, right? Caps, sweatshirts with the name of the college. They're not advertising the Department of Classics. They're not advertising chemistry. What are they advertising? Their community. My college won. That's what our brain was doing with music. My city won. So if you want to do, we Americans have to find out to make music and art education part of the general conversation of the purposes of school. Yeah? When you started your early um, high school completion associates program, did you get any pushback from faculty who felt that kids at 16, perhaps 17, weren't intellectually capable of pursuing? No, actually, no. you know, we have all PhDs teaching, so we don't have high school faculty, we have college faculty teaching. And their discovery is that, and that's my discovery too, and we have we had the original insight, we took over Simon's Rock, which is in Great Barrington, which is an early college, in 1979. So we took it over then. And um, I'm a little bit biased because I went to college at 16. So I, um, I was a beneficiary of the University of Chicago's pioneering work in the 30s and 40s in taking younger students. And they continued to do that in the 60s and 70s. And um, well, I got lucky. but. We discovered actually that um, the 16-year-old age is a terrific age, if you take them seriously, terrific, <clears throat> terrific. Um, somewhat better than 18, because by 18, the kids develop that sort of veneer of adulthood, which is to show distance and cynicism and laid-backness, which is a terrible barrier you have to overcome. So actually, I think the younger students um, are, are, are quicker, more intense. And the connection to the material, the wonderment, um, so, uh, is, is on a very high level. But quite contrary. In fact, it's very interesting question. When we started the high school, we, had the, we made a mistake. We thought the initial thing was to divide the faculty. And the faculty taught for the last two years year one and two of college, and the ninth and tenth grades. And a very, the person who ran the place, we hired to run it, was an old, long-time colleague of mine, Ray Peterson, he had the inside, Ray discovered, he said, you're making a mistake, he said, don't separate the two. I bet you, and it turns out that the PhDs, the sort of snotty PhD faculty, you know, came from Harvard, Columbia, and Yale, they actually, after about a semester, they said, can we teach ninth grade? And so the dean said, what? What do you want to teach ninth grade? We, we, they suddenly got excited. And now we have a completely integrated faculty. And so the people we hired, you know, as high school specialists for the ninth and grade, end up doing some of the college stuff. And the college people end up doing some of the ninth grade. Quite the opposite. Yeah. I'm a depression. Uh, You're not depressed. You just come from out of a depression. Right. I'm depressed. I, I, I'm depressed. That's all right. When, when football soccer starts, you know, it's fine. It's fine. It's fine. It's fine. Good for you. Morris Meister. Yeah. 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 But uh, the issue is said it many times during the presentation, problem solving. Uh, we were not taught problem solving in a 
logical way, though there are logical ways to, to do that. Each yeah. The way we learn problem solving is through laboratory work. True. And, you know, if you miswired something, you know, you have to find the answer. Right. Because the teacher wasn't around. There were also after class laboratories. Totally, yes. And I find that today schools have shortened their time frame. I read a book a long time ago called by Rick Over called the Swiss School System, in which school systems at that time were eight to five to six, whatever. Yes. And the afternoons were taken up in the areas of laboratories, the software flies, things like that, which created... Uh, so you want to know the line. good news or the bad news? Pardon? You want to know the good news or the bad news? Well, I know what the bad news is. Well, you know the good news. For 27th and yeah, right. But, you're absolutely right. So, you, the gentleman was describing that when he went to high school, in a very good high school in Europe, there was this, they taught problem solving by actually having to get themselves out of jams they created themselves in an experimental circumstance. Building something, trying to wire something, even math problems. But, you also made the point that um, uh, in the 50s particularly, uh, uh, the guy who developed a nuclear submarine on Rickover was, um, wrote a book apparently on the Swiss school system, which is a full day, very late in the day. So. Um, and want to know about this. So the good news is that the American um, consensus now is to invest in what we call after school. So there is a lot of movement to extend the school day, but not by simply extending a failed system longer. Don't make a bad movie even longer, but add into the school things that do work, that are connected to the curriculum. So the first movement was to do things that don't connect the curriculum, just babysitting and entertaining. Now they got smarter and figured they should connect to the curriculum. And so they're the after school. There's an extension of the school day. Um, and so that's the good news. Because uh, um, you're absolutely right. The other thing, of course, is that with the computer and with the communication power of the computer, the kind of thing you're talking about is ever, ever, ever more possible. You know, the same thing, why this, this doesn't work. And be able to seek help so that you, you can be, do it late at night, you know, where, where, where there's an answering service, if you will. Um, so the principles you're talking about remain intact. People learn problem solving by, by solving problems, not being taught the art of problem solving. In addition, you cannot solve a problem without knowing the variables and knowing having some connection to the outcome. If the problem is, is how do I get from here across the road, I need to have a purpose. Maybe I want to win a race. But the other possibility is, you know, I actually, my mother is on the other side of the road and uh, I need to get it to her, right? Or, you know, there's some purpose. Or there's buried treasure on the other side of the road. There's some motivation. For me. With the real problem. Yeah, my real problem. I'm trying to figure out how to get there, you know? So, I think that you're absolutely right, and, and, the, and the difficulty, of course, is that um, the hardest problem in the United States is the recruitment and training of teachers. Because, and that is really the hardest problem. The best of our own citizens do not go into public school teaching, and not high school teaching, unfortunately. On that note, I think I, yeah. I have just, one more question. Former yeah. Former teacher. Yeah. Continue teacher. I think it's how we define utility that really matters. You know, I think that's that's a big question. You have, um, um, you know, Jeremy Bentham was the inspiration for University of College London, University of College London, which was the first community college out there, because it gave an opportunity for the uh, impoverished to attend a school where they couldn't get into Harvard, um, they couldn't get to Oxford, or Oxford or Cambridge at the time. They couldn't afford it. It was on the merits. It was a meritocracy based on their intelligence right. and motivation, right? So um, Bentham did make a subtle distinction. Um, he never quite explained this fully, between truth and utility. 
because for Bentham, the idea was that the, it's, uh, utility is kind of a fiction, a, 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 a concept that's rooted in human pleasure and pain. Okay? Mm -hmm. So we direct our, our, um, you know, our kind of purpose towards trying to get to something, trying to get to utilitarianism through um, repeated experiment. Uh, this is such why, why uh, Bentham is so important to, to um, modern law, to, uh, to, to modern uh, science, um, because of that kind of approach. Now we have today doctors who think they're gods. Okay, so I think that they don't live up to that standard. I mean, for for um, for Bentham, uh, he had sort of the Baconian model, an older model of uh, repeated experiment, experiment, the scientific method. But what the scientific method is is a, is a real question. Um, you know, um, for for modern uh, doctor, for a doctor, um, the doctor would not meet the, the test of Socrates of the Olympus, the, the Socratic method, which is supposed to take our um, you know, our, our, ag our arrogance, that we think we know everything, right, which is a problem with a lot of doctors today, to prove an inconsistency in our opinions and thereby make us angry at ourselves for thinking we know everything, and that purges up our, us of our arrogance and makes us better people. So, you know, um, you have in the 20th century Karl Popper, great philosopher of science, who says, well, no, the, the problem is that you shouldn't just stay, stick with repeated uh, experiment. You have to try to prove yourself wrong. You have to try to cross-examine yourself, just as the Socratic method cross-examines uh, the, the interlocutor, the subject. Okay, so you know uh, the the proof of uh, of a good theory is not whether it can be repeated and um, you know you get it by repetition. You kind of uh, it's whether it can survive your attempts to prove it wrong. And a lot of scientists can't stand Karl Popper because they think he's kind of uh, impractical. But he actually, I think, has a stronger model of science. So what is utilitarianism, I think, is very much a question. I think we have to kind of, at least we have to ask ourselves that. Yeah, but Jesse, Jesse you're, you're at a level of philosophical sophistication, which may not be relevant. But here, let's bring it down for a second, OK? Um, you take mathematical proofs, right? You know, Plato said, you want to achieve real knowledge, you have to have math to get to ultimate knowledge. Maybe we drink Plato's Kool-Aid, OK? I tell my students, don't, don't, don't necessarily assume that he's right, right? OK, but the geometric proofs, which used to be required in most geometry classes in, in America. About 15, 20 years ago, they stopped being mandated um, by the National Council of Teachers for Mathematics, okay? So teachers who want to be members of NCTM no longer had to teach geometric proofs, okay? Um, that's a disaster for American No, I, I, I agree with you. I, look, there's no question that, that uh, a, good, um, a good curriculum to be useful uh, uh, has to teach skills which, which in a common sense way, not a philosophical way, because I don't know really about truth, and so it's hard for me to talk about that, but in a way has the utilities I describe it. Right. I did re-describe utility as being a kind of fundamental uh, education of the citizen that he or she feels right. that her his place in the world right. has some meaning, some utility, and that their life is in, in that they can control their own life to fill it with some sense of value. Right. Now, but I also think you raising the issue of the doctors is, is very important. I don't think the doctor today feels any more godlike than she or he did a long time ago. The condition of the doctor requires more general education today because they are more regulated, they have less discretion, and very significantly, the process of analysis is now um, has shifted to the burden of sifting through test results as opposed to what we used to call differential diagnosis. So the doctor actually is functioning a little bit differently. And the regulation of the doctor, and this is not the problem of Obamacare, it's a problem of, of, of fee for service medical care to begin with, which the Obamacare doesn't get rid of, um, is that the doctor no longer actually is treating the patient but the disease. That the, so they are looking, they're disconnecting the patient from, from the actual context of the life, and that has a subspecialization. It's a complicated question. But do I think that the proper education of the doctor is a person who, for example, understands ethical issues? can solve problems about whether to treat or not to treat. How to view an 83-year-old patient who has a disease X, where the quality of life 
the protocol insists that one does that. Can one make the choice to say, you know, to, to, to counsel with the family what the intervention ought to be? Um, a doctor who understands the difference between treating a patient who has a certain set of religious beliefs and comes from a certain cultural background, the patient who does not. How to communicate um, to, um, so, so it goes. So the kind of um, utility of the humanities, for example, um, for lawyers and for doctors and for business people is huge. <coughs> What 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 the what what the what the reductive definition of utility that you fight with legislators and so misunderstands is that their definition of utility is simply for tomorrow's paycheck. It's not for the paycheck two years from now. It's not for the competitive world that, that the people who come out of institutions like this will face fifteen years after their graduation. That kind of education is much more fundamental, it's much more, it's less tied to a medical technology degree that, that when, when, that when those machines no longer are in use. So it is, um, you, the real useful education is unfortunately the most basic, intellectually. Thank you very much. <laughs>